Good morning, church. I have two pullovers that look almost exactly the same, and this is the other one. This morning, I wanted to take you to a passage in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22 is a great chapter because it's the one that contains Jesus' statement on the greatest commandment. Anyway, in chapter 22, we're not looking at that verse. We're looking at a different passage that I think is really interesting. Verse 23, it says, That same day, Sadducees, who say there's no resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. Now, this is important, first of all, because you have to realize who the Sadducees are. The Sadducees did not believe that there was a thing that would be called the resurrection. They did not believe that God would raise people from the dead. That's why they're sad, you see. <laughs> anyway, so the Sadducees, unlike the Pharisees, believe that once you're dead, you're dead. That's just it. There is no soul or spirit apart from the body. They just believe that this life is all that we had. So anyway, the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection, so they decided to test Jesus with a question. Verse 24, Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offering, offspring for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. And the same thing happened to the second and third brother, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Now, first of all, this is a very interesting thing. I don't think it really happened. I think the Sadducees are telling a fictional story. If it really happened, then I'm really kind of wondering why brothers six and seven went ahead and married this woman, considering every one of their other brothers has died after they married this woman. Anyway, I don't, I don't get it. But that's why I think this is just kind of a, a testing fake story. They, you know, Jesus made up parables, and so these guys made up a kind of a parable too to test Jesus. Anyway, Jesus responds to it um, in just about the most perfect way possible. Jesus replied, verse 29, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. Jesus identifies for them two reasons why their entire premise is wrong. Two reasons why they themselves are wrong. He gives them two reasons. One, you don't know the scriptures. And two, you don't know the power of God. And then he proceeds to give them two explanations that should address these two things. The first explanation Jesus addresses is not something in scripture. He gives them an explanation that is simply, we can assume, based on an understanding of the power of God. Verse 30. Jesus says at the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Uh, the reason I think this is an explanation of the power of God is that Jesus is saying, listen, hang on a second. This is absolutely ludicrous for you to come up with some human situation that somehow makes God's situation impossible. That's not the way life works. God created everything. He's not surprised by human beings. He's not surprised by their activity. He's not surprised by the situations they get in. God has enough power to solve all the problems before they even arise. And God's plan for resurrection doesn't even address any of these human problems because God's plan for the resurrection is to make you more than human. God's plan for the resurrection is to transform you into beings that are, that are better than human somehow. In a sense, kind of like the angels in heaven. But uh, Jesus is just basically saying God's power goes beyond your imagination. Nevertheless, it's the next thing Jesus says that is the most important, I think. Verse 31, he says, But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? And now we clearly understand that Jesus is talking about the scriptures. He told them before they were in error because they didn't understand the scriptures or the power of God. And now he is doing the scripture part. Now he is saying, here's the part of the scriptures that you have not understood. Have you not read what God said to you? Verse 32, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is now quoting from Moses' experience at the burning bush. And Jesus makes this final claim. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. 
You see, here's the deal. The Sadducees, and frankly, a lot of other people, had this mindset that human beings die, and then one of these days, God has to do something extra special to bring them back to life. That they die, and God has to do something sort of miraculous to bring them back to life. And the resurrection, if it requires a miracle, is something that now we need to have an explanation about. But Jesus says, no, 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 you've misunderstood the scriptures. God says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then Jesus says, do you not realize that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living? So if God is the God of Abraham, and God is the God of the living, then Jesus' claim is pretty obvious, isn't it? People don't die. That's an interesting claim. People don't die. Their bodies might die, but they don't die. If God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob 400 years after Jacob is dead, and if God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead, then we thought Jacob died, but he didn't. Jacob is still alive somehow in some way, in some fashion. He just doesn't have a body. Here is the thing that Christians have believed for centuries. It's the way Paul described it. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's the way Jesus described it, hanging on the cross next to the thief. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the way Jesus described it when he's talking about Lazarus. He said, The one who dies believing in me will live even though he dies. And those who believe in me will never die. See, here's the thing that the Bible continues to affirm over and over and over again. You and the human beings around you are eternal. You will not die. Human beings don't die. Similar to angels in heaven, you do not die. You might lose a body for a period of time. And God might need to resurrect or recreate or give you a new body, but you won't die. Listen, a lot of times human beings are afraid of death. And Jesus wants to remind you, no, 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 God is the God of the living, not the dead. And if he is your God, you don't have to worry about death. The second thing, though, is that a lot of times, a lot of times we forget that the person sitting next to us I mean, not now, because we're all in coronavirus isolation time. We're not riding the bus and and all that stuff. But maybe I'll put it to you this way. The UPS driver who's bringing your Amazon products to your door is a person who's never going to die. One of these days, that person is going to be in your eyes like the angels in heaven, shrouded in glory, a being which you cannot even imagine today. And if you were to see today, you would fall on your face in terror, wondering if it was your last moment on earth. See, every single one of us is a divine being. Humans are divine beings. The people around you are divine beings. And the people that you are trying to protect from getting the coronavirus by your own self-isolation or whatever it is that you're doing. When you show love to your neighbor, when you show love to someone else, when you speak a kind word to someone, you are speaking a kind word to a being who in the eyes of God is just very similar to the angels in heaven. Listen, I don't want to go too far with this. A lot of times Christians have gone too far with this and they're like, whatever God is, we will someday be. That's not the truth. God is God. And when I say human beings are are divine entities, I'm not saying that human beings are gods. I'm saying that human beings have a nature that is above and beyond what we see with our eyes. And God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And Jesus says, you don't have to worry about resurrection as the time when you come back to life because you are are a being that is alive. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Surely you might sleep, 
but that doesn't mean you've died. Listen, the people that God has made on this earth are so glorious, you cannot possibly imagine it. I want to invite you to bring honor to your God with how you represent his eternality with your eternality, beginning today. And I want you to be a person who honors God with how you honor the eternal beings around you. And let's be people who recognize that God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Let me pray for you. Father, it is astounding and beyond our comprehension to think of ourselves as eternal. It is astounding and beyond our comprehension to think of other people as eternal. And Lord, there are all kinds of ways that we can misunderstand and misapply this. We could misapply it to think that we are more than we actually are. We can misapply it to think that the people around us are less today than they actually are. We can misapply it by thinking that the physical body is irrelevant and we can reject or ignore what happens to it in ourselves or in others. We can misapply this principle in all kinds of ways. But Jesus, I just pray today that you would help us to apply it in the one simple way that you have made us to be eternal and that has eternal consequences, eternal ramifications, and that you are a God not over the dead, but over the living. Lord Jesus, would you teach us today how to live our living well and to represent our God well. Jesus, thank you for giving us an amazing life. We pray all this in your name, asking that you would do these things according to your will in our lives, for your purposes in our lives. Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen. I want to thank you for being with me this morning. Go and represent the eternal God in an eternal way today. God bless you.